Today's keynote will be delivered by Högni Kalsö Hansen. Högni is an associate professor at the University of Copenhagen, uh, the Department of uh, Geosciences and Natural Resource Management. He's a geographer working with regional development in both urban and peripheral areas. Högni has been working along these lines both in Sweden and in Denmark. His work primarily focuses on migration and mobility patterns of the labor force in combination with uneven development based on matches and mismatches between industrial structures and skill composition of the labor force. Today, he's going to talk about the interplay between regional development, labor market dynamics and the public sector from a Nordic perspective. He will present to us some dominating development structures in Denmark in recent years and based on this discuss the role of public sector in employment and point to the gaps in our knowledge about the relationship between the public sector and the regional development. So Högni, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, very much looking forward um, to your presentation. Okay. Um, we can see your presentation very well. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much for being uh, invited to uh, to share some of uh, of the work that I've done in the past and some of the work that I'm thinking about doing in the future. Uh, some of the uh, thoughts that uh, I have been puzzling with uh, during uh, the last many years, um, as uh, as you as you can see, uh, one of the things that I've been struggling with is uh, is the role of the of the public sector and I'll try to to uh, my idea is now to 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 just give a short introduction to the uh, regional development trends in general uh, especially in the case of Denmark uh, but the case of Denmark is not very different from from the case of the other Nordic countries I've been working uh, a lot of sweet in Sweden as well uh, and I think that there's uh, some uh, uh, um, a lot of things that are common, um, and when I've done that, I'll try to 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 reflect a little on how the public sector uh, plays, uh, what kind of role the public sector has in this, um, and point to to some of the research gaps that I think is uh, important to address in the future. So generally. Uh, the driving forces of regional development today is uh, to a large extent, as we know, that human capital and migration of the workforce is central for understanding the dynamics of regional development. Uh, production is getting more and more uh, capital and knowledge intensive, uh, and therefore there's a, a growing focus on how to attract and retain um, highly skilled people. At the same time, uh, if we go back in time, Massey argued in uh, 1984 that uh, investments are selective. Uh, I think that it's fair to say that, that we can see now that there is a tendency uh, for investments to be selective in the sense that uh, they reinforce the structure of production of human capital. So uh, investments that ask for, for high uh, human capital input tend to to uh, to locate in cities uh, and regions where there is a high human capital uh, uh, stock in the first place. This causes a concentration of highly skilled jobs uh, in some regions, uh, primarily in urban regions, and allocate more routinized jobs functions into more peripheral regions. And that way we create some kind of a gap uh, between or, a, or between rural and, and, and peripheral areas uh, compared to to um, to urban areas. And of course, uh, during the last uh, decade or maybe a little more than a decade, maybe two decades, there's been a lot of focus on differences in, in regions ca capability of, uh, of staying competitive over time. We've been talking a lot about resilience and it's much about the ability to absorb economic shocks that some regions uh, recover faster than other regions, probably due to variety on the one hand and relatedness on the other hand of industries and job functions. So that's kind of the, the general argument uh, put forward. Um, if we try to look at the case of Denmark, we have a traditional, we can divide Denmark into four, the Danish municipalities into four groups. We have uh, urban uh, areas, we have uh, more intermediate uh, reach, uh, municipalities, we have rural and peripheral uh, municipalities. And of course, the rural and peripheral uh, 
uh, municipalities are the one that are suffering the most uh, at the moment uh, in regard to economic development. So I've just brought two uh, uh, articles from, from, from newspapers here. Uh, it's an article uh, saying that uh, Copenhagen is uh, driving economic growth and development uh, and is by far it's the region that benefit most from uh, current development structures. So here in this in this article from newspaper, it says that uh, the population in Copenhagen has on average an income that is more than double uh, compared to the neighboring regions, which is quite a lot, right? Um, on the other hand, we have uh, another article here saying that from another newspaper saying that people living in the periphery uh, in Denmark is the happiest people in Europe, right? So we have kind of uh, just just to say that there is a, 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 an ongoing discussion of, of how to, to connect urban and regional, uh, urban and peripheral areas, uh, but also um, that there is some special things in, in urban areas uh, that are, are uh, 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 cherished and there's also uh, some qualities in uh, in uh, peripheral areas that are cherished as well right um in general if we look at uh, employment growth in and decline in denmark over a period from the crisis in 2008 and onward to to 2019 uh, what we see here is a map showing the uh, the tendencies of employment growth, and and I think that what is what is uh, interesting and not very different from uh, from other uh, Nordic countries, and least probably also a lot of of, uh, of European countries, is that we see that the employment growth is uh, very much in the areas that has uh, the highest uh, level of urbanity, so to speak. Right. So so job growth are uh, taking place in the major cities, uh, whereas if we see here, we have the uh, the very light blue uh, municipalities that's municipalities that have uh, experienced a decline of uh, minus uh, 30 to minus 15 percent uh, job growth in this period that's quite a lot uh, and it creates some frustration in these uh, areas right um, so on the one hand we have the 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 urban areas uh, where the growth is and then we have uh, the peripheral areas that are uh, suffering quite a lot as I said before, there's a tendency, or and 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 all the things that I've done so far also show that there's a, a link between uh, location of human capital on the one side and um, uh, generating job growth on the other side. Um, and if we look at uh, the location quotients of uh, human capital in Denmark, uh, here's a map from 2002 and uh, 2008 and 2019. We see that uh, only the uh, two darkest blues areas are the areas that are um, that have a location quotient uh, above one, which is above the national average. Uh, and we can see that uh, if we look at from 2008 to 2019, we can see that fewer. Well, there might be more. Uh, the the number of of uh, of, of regions that that uh, goes from uh, the general level increases, but we can also see that the concentration of human capital actually tend to, to be even uh, stronger over this period. So we have uh, a more uh, concentrated uh, dark blue areas uh, over here compared to, to 2008. So, so the process is going on. We still see that uh, human capital concentrate even more uh, compared to earlier. So how does this uh, relate to uh, growth rates in population? Well, uh, here's a, a second map uh, of Denmark as well, where we can see that, uh, as in many other countries and in, in the Nordic countries uh, as well, we can see that there is a tendency for um, for population growth to happen in uh, in areas close to the to the to the major urban uh, or to the major cities in Copenhagen 
uh, and maybe also in the commuting areas uh, close to to uh, to these uh, regions. So within an hour or maybe a little less than an hour, uh, we can see that this uh, pattern. Um, on the other hand, we can see that uh, that there is these uh, very light blue areas, uh, which is uh, many of the areas that are uh, the most far away from urban areas. That suffer uh, and and uh, experience uh, a, a rather uh, marked decline in uh, in population uh, in this period of time. Um, and of course, one of the things that uh, that politicians are interested in in Denmark and planners and so on is uh, how do we actually manage to get people to live in some of these uh, not uh, move from from uh, urban areas to to more rural and peripheral areas in order to make a more sustainable uh, economic situation for the municipalities that are uh, more remotely located. Um, and one of the things that I have been uh, looking at at the past is uh, how uh, mobility or the pattern of mobility of of uh, of uh, highly educated on the one side. Uh, but also on uh, what we call low educated people on the other side that, that is basically people that has uh, that do not have many years in uh, of education um, so uh, what we can see in this graph uh, is the migration rate uh, of people we can see that uh, people tend to move uh, if we take the uh, low educated we can see the people tend to move uh, make the first move around 18 when they move uh, away from home probably uh, and then they move uh, uh, well it tops uh, when they are about 24 uh, 23 years old uh, and then uh, the migration rate uh, of these people actually decline uh, quite a lot uh, and when we end up in the uh, in the early 30s uh, or mid 30s we do not see much mobility among uh, low educated anymore. Uh, the same story goes more or less uh, with uh, the highly educated. Uh, they tend to have a little higher uh, share or migration rate uh, compared to, to the low educated, but in general, it also flattens out really quick. Uh, and we can see that again, when when they are around uh, in in the mid 30s, there's not much uh, mobility going on for that for this group anymore. So basically, what we can see from this is that there is a tendency for people to move when they are young, uh, probably move for uh, for education or something like that, and maybe their first job. But after that, there's not much uh, mobility going on uh, among neither uh, low educated or high educated. If we kind of group them into these uh, two rough categories. So, uh, of course, it's interesting to know whether you can actually manage the, uh, to, to get some of these people out uh, to the periphery uh, in order to stimulate economic growth. And uh, one of the things that we have tried to do uh, is that we have uh, looked at a group of, uh, of uh, people that was uh, that had a a high education or a university education in uh, in uh, 2003 and 2004 moved from uh, uh, from from the uh, from an urban area to a peripheral area. So um, what we can see here is that what we did uh, and what we found out is that we could try to or that we could uh, uh, divide uh, these uh, migrants into four different groups or three different groups. We can say that for all of them, that's not very many people that tend to to move from urban areas to peripheral areas. But we wanted to know something about what is actually the reason why they do this. And what we saw uh, was that, um, uh, or what we ended up doing is was that we divided this, this group into to three different, uh, or these people into three different groups, namely the newly highly educated, that's people that are uh, educated uh, one year prior to the move, uh, or finish the education one one year prior to to when they migrate and and for this group uh, we also beside looking at uh, at uh, register data on where they were located the following years we also uh, had some 
uh, interviews with them. And what they argued here is that uh, they uh, moved to or relocated to peripheral areas, uh, but they considered this as a temporary move. Uh, so these people are typically young people who are single and, and on their move. And, and what made them move to peripheral areas was uh, job opportunities that could kick off or kickstart their career. So they wanted to go out there because they found that, that the job uh, that they could get out there was, was quite interesting. Um, and, uh, and one of the things that they also argued was that the task uh, of the job that the peripheral, that the peripheral job could give was actually more challenging uh, than what they could give in uh, what they could get in larger cities and therefore they they saw it as an opportunity to boost their uh, their, their CV so these people these uh, young uh, newly highly uh, highly educated move uh, for for particular re reasons and that is to get uh, some uh, experience under their belt then there's a group of uh, young people uh, with uh, or young families with children, uh, and they relocate for other regions. They relocate primarily as as a, or see it as a as a permanent position uh, because they seek uh, nature and calmness, uh, and they seek towards these places where their families lives or used to live at least. So so they're very much. Uh, their movement is very much about social uh, relations uh, to in that area where they moved to. Um, and then there was a last group that was persons uh, above 30, uh, above 40, and, and they relocated. Uh, they, con they considered relocation as something temporary as well. Uh, but their reasons was more like they, they wanted to seek new challenges to, 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 to their career. Uh, they were tired of what they wanted to do, and they want to, to try to to make a, a career change. Uh, and actually, they also argued that jobs in the periphery uh, uh, allowed them to, you know, change career and try something new. Uh, however, for all groups, uh, they argued that uh, the job opportunities or the opening of a job opportunity is actually what triggered them to move. So they're very much about. Uh, moving due to job opportunities rather than just moving for for because that was what they wanted to do. So they wanted to have a job before they they take the decision to move or action to move. If we follow these people, uh, what we have done then is to follow them uh, over a period of time. So so we have 100% uh, that moves in uh, in 2004, and then we see what happens uh, the following six years. And if we see, uh, at, if we look at these newly, highly, newly graduated, uh, highly educated migrants, we can see that after uh, after six years, only 37% is left right, uh, in the peripheral area. So 60% has actually, 65% uh, has actually moved uh, somewhere else. Uh, sorry, 63% has, has moved somewhere else uh, later on. Right. So that's definitely not uh, a something permanent and it it and it it, uh, it uh, aligns very well with their argument that they they think that it's a temporary it's a, uh, a temporary move is about getting into to uh, to the periphery or getting job experience and then move on to something else if we look at uh, migrants with family and kids we can also see here that uh, about 75% or 50, 65% 66% is left uh, after these six year period, so many of them has actually moved somewhere else uh, during the, the six years that we look at. Uh, and again, we can see that um, uh, when it comes to, to uh, let's see, this one highly educated about 40, we can also see that this group tend to uh, are approximately uh, at the same level, 65 66 percent is left in the periphery after a six-year period so there is uh, at least to some extent a tendency for people to to uh, that that move to the periphery to uh, to move uh, back uh, to something else not necessarily the urban areas it might be a rural or it might be an intermediary uh, municipality but the point is that they are that they are moving and they do not necessarily uh, attracting uh, migrants to peripheral regions do not necessarily mean that they stay there. So one of the things that could be interesting to look at is uh, 
the situation of uh, if you are fired, uh, if you are uh, kind of, if you want to understand the the migration patterns uh, of of people, uh, it might be interesting to look at what happens actually if they 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 uh, get a shock like uh, if they're fired. Uh, and and uh, what we have done here is that we have tried to look at a situation of uh, of laid off workers two years after they were laid off, uh, based on what kind of region uh, that they were fired within. Right. So uh, so we have urban regions, we have intermediate regions, we have rural regions, and we have peripheral regions. Uh, and so we look at. Uh, at one year, a person get fired, and then uh, what happens after that? And what we can see is that uh, no matter whether you are in an urban area, in a or fired in an urban area, in, in an intermediate area, rural area, or peripheral area, uh, more than yeah, approximately 91% of of this uh, group is actually re-employed. Um, and the other thing is that where there's a, a marked difference or, or, or a substantial difference between the two groups is that uh, there tend to be more people that go into uh, education after being fired in urban regions compared to peripheral regions, which can make sense in many ways. So uh, if we wanted to look at, um, to use it to look at the probability of migrating within two years. So, okay, if you're fired, then what is the possibility of of of, uh, of migrating uh, or moving to another region? Uh, we tried to do that, uh, and I'm not going to to present all these uh, estimations here. Uh, I'm tr try to put it in a more uh, um, visual way. Uh, what we what we found was that there was actually not a higher uh, probability of people in uh, rural or or, or uh, peripheral areas to move to another area compared to urban um, areas. Okay, so basically what we found is that, that people do not really move, uh, they are re-employed, that uh, young people, uh, if people move, that's typically young people that move uh, to urban areas to undergo a, a and education, and then of course that um, that there's a lot of, of social and economic issues in, involved in this, like uh, age, migration, uh, ethnicity, and so on, has a negative effect on on whether to move or not. So, um, what is general in Denmark, and which I think is very uh, common uh, across Europe, uh, is that the population loss uh, increases with the uh, increases as a benefit urbanity decreases. Uh, if people move, they prim primarily move for job opportunities for themselves uh, and for their spouses, typically. Uh, also, that uh, job losses increase with, increases with distance to larger uh, cities, and this kind of create a division of uh, production or labor, where urban areas uh, have uh, more new knowledge-based intensive jobs compared to peripheral areas that tend to have more routinized jobs. And also that if we look uh, in Denmark and many other places, we can see that there's a general increase in the uh, level of education and skills, uh, but that uh, urban areas tend to increase their capital stock more than the uh, rural and peripheral areas. So the gap between the two is actually uh, growing. Um, so, and then of course, which I think is quite important in, in this is that people are not as uh, mobile as uh, uh, in the Nordic countries, at least as uh, much uh, US uh, inspired literature tend to argue. So we need to have these things in mind. So, where uh, this uh, kind of uh, development and these structures uh, tend to 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 influence the way that that politician thinks and and that they can see that there tend to be this uh, growing uh, gap between or whatever we should call it more equal unequal development between uh, rural and peripheral areas on the one side and urban areas on the other side. So there's a political wish for. Uh, a more equal development, uh, and uh, this is uh, based on a lot of different things. Uh, the bottom line is that uh, 
the government uh, in Denmark, in Sweden, in Norway, and many other places tend to use the, or at least think of the public sector as a kind of a lever for uh, regional development. And this uh, has to do with a lot of different things. For example, uh, uh, Rodriguez Post has shown that, that there is an increasing uh, alienation and mistrust between rural areas on the one side and urban areas on the other side. And of course, in order to, 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 to make more trust, uh, the relocation of economic activities into uh, to rural areas is, is one of the things that you can do or maybe can do. So the public workforce, at least in Denmark, uh, makes up to uh, approximately 40-30% uh, of the of the total employment, and that's quite quite a lot actually. Uh, and and I think that one of my 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 concerns here is that that we tend to think of the uh, of the or we tend to mention the the public sector, but more as, as an add-on to to what is going on in general, and not much to think about what is actually what kind of dynamics does it actually. Uh, uh, develop uh, on local labor markets or on regional labor market. So the, pub, the, the public sector, we can divide that one into two different groups. We have uh, the far largest group uh, of, of employed. They are uh, employed in, uh, in jobs that are strongly re related to where people live, that is school, daycare, police, and so on. That's, uh, that's uh, almost proportional with, uh, with, uh, with where people uh, live. On the other hand, there is a what I would say a substantial part, which is uh, less sensitive to where people live. This can be government agencies, uh, higher education institutions, military, and so on. And this, this kind of uh, this part of the public sector is highly mobile, and and some or maybe high, not highly mobile, but at least possible to to uh, to, to to move around, uh, and something that is used in uh, in political uh, decision making. So this uh, less uh, population sensitive part of the public sector, uh, which uh, consists of uh, about maybe 30% of the total public sector, uh, can be relocated based on political decision making. Uh, and therefore, it's just th uh, thought of often as an instrument to revitalize uh, regional growth or maybe just decrease decline in, uh, in many different regions. So, um, but the thing is that at least uh, from 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 my reading and from my studies, uh, I would argue that we do not know much about how the public sector actually influences the local labor market uh, in both in long and and short term, and especially long term. So, uh, as in many other countries, uh, the Danish government uh, launched in 2015 and 2018 plans for relocation of government agencies. They wanted to move uh, 9,000 uh, jobs from uh, from the uh, from the uh, Copenhagen area to the rest of the country. Uh, and as you can see uh, on these maps, uh, they are widely spread uh, across uh, Denmark. These jobs, and I have to say that not all uh, not all jobs are efficiently moved by now. Uh, it's a long process, but it's just to show that that this is actually something that that uh, that has been broadly uh, accepted politically and, and initiated. So um, if we look at the uh, share of uh, employment in the public sector uh, in 2019, we can see that uh, the areas that has the highest share of the public sector is also the area, uh, many of the areas that was, that was relatively low in uh, in, in job uh, growth and population growth and so on uh, uh, from the earlier slides. We can also see that uh, growth in the public sector uh, in the period uh, is actually something that is uh, slightly more uh, uh, broadly uh, uh, or dispersed uh, compared to, to the private sector, to the jobs that I showed early on, but still it's also uh, something that is relatively close to uh, urban areas at least, uh, but maybe not concentrated to the same degree as early on. If we look at the share of these, which are called less population sensitive public sector employment uh, in 2019 here, we can see that uh, these are actually uh, 
concentrated in a lot of uh, other places or have a high share in, in, in many other places than, than the urban area. So these are the most urbanized areas and we can see that these uh, activities are actually uh, something that has um, that has a high share uh, other places. Um, and I think that that, uh, that this shows that it's it's a it's it's a it's a it's a sector that that is is quite different from from our uh, from from private uh, employment sector in general. Um, and if we look at uh, human capital uh, in the private sector compared to in the public sector, we can also see that this is location quotients uh, of the two. We can see that here we have the location quotient of the public sector in 2000 uh, of, of human capital in 2019. Uh, we can see that uh, this is uh, actually more uh, dispersed compared to this one, where it's uh, human capital in the private sector. So uh, although uh, the, the country is, uh, the general level is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is increasing in, in, uh, in human capital, we can see that it still tends to concentrate, but that uh, human capital in the public sector is actually more dispersed, dispersed and therefore maybe also uh, make sure that 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 uh, that the differences between regions is not as large as it could be. Um, the study that uh, if you look at what people actually do. I argue that that the public sector is is uh, is a valuable uh, tool in many ways, uh, but we also need to think about what the uh, the public sector actually can do. And and one of the things that that uh, I have looked at problem earlier, these is uh, uh, numbers are a little uh, a little old, but I've been looking at how uh, people that move from urban areas to peripheral to peripheral areas, what kind of jobs they they went into when moving and and what we can see here is that uh, although it changes over time there is uh, a much higher share of of, of uh, highly educated people that move to peripheral regions to enter a public sector job uh, compared to a private sector job so this kind of indicate that the public sector can act actually be something that can uh, a public sector job can be something that can can make uh, a more uh, kind of higher increases mobility on, on and migration on, on the labor market in regard to, to uh, getting people uh, to more peripheral areas. So uh, if we look at the relation between general growth parameters, uh, parameters and the public sector uh, in Denmark in the period of 2008 to 2009, and I have to say this is very preliminary results, uh, I need to 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 work uh, much more on them and 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 make sure that that they are um, um, uh, that they are, are showing these indicators that we are that that I'm presenting now. Uh, but it seems like there is a positive uh, correlation between job growth uh, and the public sector employment uh, in general. We can also see that uh, that tend to be, or it looks like, uh, urban municipalities has a stronger uh, correlation between job growth and location of public sector compared to rural and peripheral areas. Uh, and then we can see that there is a positive, although not very strong, uh, correlation between growth in the public sector and growth in the private sector. But what I ask also want to argue is that we still do not really know the effect of government relocation plans uh, from 2015 to 2018 how they um, how they interfere uh, with the uh, um, with the regional uh, labor market so some of my thoughts here is that um, and this is where i think uh, where i plan that my research will go in the future uh, on uh, investigating the the role of the public sector is that uh, we lack knowledge on the relationship between the public sector employment and re and the regional uh, labor market in general. So we uh, we need to know something about the uh, the effects of growth and decline in the public sector uh, on the regional labor market. Uh, we need to know how the labor market react to changes in the public sector employment. Uh, some has argued uh, that the public sector is crowding out private sector activities. 
So uh, Fadio and Overman ha has shown that there is some uh, negative multiplier effects when the uh, public sector move into an area. Uh, we have also seen that uh, or uh, Alessina uh, and uh, Siko uh, argue that uh, that the public sector uh, movement, a uh, move of the public sector into an area, actually uh, challenges the uh, uh, or reduce entrepreneurship and also make people move from the public from the private sector to the public sector because the jobs are more. Uh, uh, a more uh, secure and better better paid apparently um also uh some argue that uh, moving uh public sector jobs out to the periphery uh actually retain uh, challenging regions uh, in a dependency relationship and it restrains a uh, new path creation uh, for these uh, areas or these regions on the other hand uh, public sector uh, can facilitate people to move to peripheral areas uh, because the uh, jobs there are uh, are interesting, uh, which I showed earlier. Um, and and I think that in general it's a very incons uh, inconsistent findings in the literature. So especially when it comes to 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 the Nordic countries where we actually use the public sector quite uh, aggressive to to try to 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 uh, to even out economic growth uh, i think that we need to study uh, the relationship between the public sector on the one hand uh, and and regional development uh, on the other hand uh, especially because uh, wage levels are not uh, markedly different between uh, regions, uh, whether they're urban or, or whether they are um, are, uh, are peripheral. Uh, another thing which I think is important to 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 look at is, uh, and I think something that we need to think about, is what kind of interaction there is between. Uh, labor uh, employed in the public sector and the private sector, for example, to what extent uh, and and how redundant labor from public sector is absorbed into the private sector and vice versa, right? What can, what's actually, what kind of capabilities uh, do they have? Where do they fit in? Uh, and this, I think this is important uh, in order to, to understand, uh, again, uh, how the dynamics are. Uh, I also think that uh, we need to know uh, who moves into public jobs when uh, when the public sector uh, uh, expands somewhere, uh, and and uh, and what are the consequences for uh, the sectors that 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 kind of labor leave from? Right. So, what are the uh, what are the outcomes? What are the multipliers uh, when the public sector move into a certain place? Because it's not some it's not that they just employ people that are unemployed it's also that they actually uh, source labor from 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 other uh, types of uh, of uh, from from private firms for example and then i think that's uh, based on some of the uh, the talks that we had with people that moved to the peripheral areas the 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 young uh, newly educated i think that it's interesting that that we might also be able to see the public sector as a kind of a stepping stone into the private sector, for example, uh, that it helps to employees to, and, and especially newly employed, to build uh, their CV um, and and uh, and maybe also that the job possibilities in the periphery are more challenges and, and thereby uh, it might be an easier way for or, or a better career. Uh, path uh, for people to go out in the periphery to get a job and then maybe move on to to other places and get some in, uh, something under their belt. So uh, the public sector uh, do act as a redistributor of jobs and uh, human capital, uh, but in my opinion, we need to better understand how the dynamics of the public sector. Uh, affects the overall regional development. So we need to understand what kind of, uh, of how different types of, um, of states organization or varieties of capitalism actually allows for different kinds of po uh, political intervention and what is the associated output. Uh, I think it's important that we look into how regions with different characteristics uh, affect to changes in the public sector urban, rural and peripheral areas might, or urban areas might uh, 
react differently to peripheral areas. Uh, we need to look into uh, whether mono or highly diverse industrial regions uh, actually uh, react differently. Um, again, also maybe to look at uh, or to try to look into how and if the uh, public sector actually act as a, some, some kind of competence booster for individual labor. Uh, and in my opinion, the Nordic welfare states are uh, very illustrative cases uh, in order to understand uh, the impact of the public sector uh, as a general tool in regional policies. Um, but again, we need more knowledge about this. We need to know about and we need to, to make uh, studies on the dynamics uh, of the public sector and how uh, in order to develop the best policies that can 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 generate the best uh, regional growth uh, policies in general. So just a quick one that uh, work thoughts and results are not my own. They are also uh, based on, on collaboration with a lot of other people uh, which are mentioned here. Uh, and uh, I think that would be more or less what I had planned to say.